Okay. Well, as many of you know, Nathan and I were sent by our church over to Israel with the, uh, a group called Behold Israel, which is led by Amir Sarfati. You can YouTube him. He does a lot on YouTube. Uh, really good ministry. He's a, um, a an Israeli Christian, so a Messianic Jew, you might call him. Um, he's, he was... Um, he served in, well, obviously he served in the IDF. He was a major, or still is, in the IDF. But anyways, his ministry um, does a lot of things from prophecy updates on YouTube to uh, teaching seminars and tours in Israel. And uh, our particular group was a young adults group. Um, we were supposed to go back in 2019, but COVID well, put it off, uh, 2020, I think. COVID put it off uh, a couple years, and so... We went and we were there with a group of about 80 kids from like 18 up to 27. I'm 30, so I was the oldest one there. Um, and so we're going to take you through a couple of the pictures. Oh, it's like they threw it in the... That's okay. I thought we were just supposed to guess. <laughs> just click on the first one. Don't worry, I'll that was an appetizer. I'll explain what those are. Yeah, we won't, we won't go back to these at all, don't worry. <laughs> um, oh, a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so this is our this is our flight out from Newark, New Jersey. I just thought it was kind of cool. It was what ten hours to get out there. Um, How many? Ten About hours time. to get out there from uh, Newark. It was a whole day long just to go out there. The flight back was a lot longer because we went up and over through Greenland and down to California. Um, we like to travel over land and stuff, but it was kind of fun because we traveled across, I mean, you couldn't see it, but we traveled across Spain and across the Mediterranean and basically flew over the Bible map and got to Israel. So that was pretty neat. Um, anyways, that's in Tel Aviv. As we were flying in, I took a picture of that. Um, we were told that Tel Aviv is about half the size, population-wise, of Jerusalem, about 500,000 people. Uh, Jerusalem has about a million. And about 80% of the people in Tel Aviv are uh, secular. It's a very worldly town. It was Pride Month when we were there, and Tel Aviv was uh, painted the rainbow colors, practically, um, as opposed to Jerusalem, which is um, about 80% religious. And so they have a lot of Orthodox Jews and also um, Christians and also some a lot of Islam there as well because of the Temple Mount and everything. Um, so not a whole lot of um, secularism there compared to Tel Aviv. So Tel Aviv is kind of like the the other side of the coin, if you will, compared to Jerusalem from, from a religious standpoint. Suburb of New York. Yeah, that kind of thing. So um, anyways, that's what we first flew into. We saw Tel Aviv there, and that was, that was pretty interesting. It's called Tel Aviv because we were told that Tel Aviv means Tel as in hill. Um, Mattel is where they've built cities upon cities over the millennia, and so, um, and Aviv means spring, and so Spring Hill, something to that effect, and they originally named it that to emphasize the newness of this new city, it's only about 100 years old, and, um, but also to combine it with its um, age, because of the, it's right next to Joppa, it's part of the ancient, you know, it's mixed in with all the ancient heritage of the nation, so, anyways. That was interesting. Um, one of the youngest places we actually went while we were there, and it's as old as anything around here. That I just included that because that's a picture of what we were told it was uh, St. Peter's Church. Um, and that is in Tel Aviv. Well, at Joppa, actually. Um, I thought that was really neat. You can go ahead and click to the next one. I don't know if it's the immediate next one. No, it's not. Okay. Some of these are a little bit out of order chronologically just because of the way Google. You can go ahead and go back. Um, no, it's okay. Just cycle through them. Yeah. Anyways, I have a picture of the inside that I'll talk about um, later. We can go ahead and go on to the next one. Okay. We um, So we landed in Tel Aviv, and that's where we spent the night, the first night, and then we um, went to... Um, that's good. Yeah, it worked. Um, so we toured <coughs> Joppa and uh, Caesarea, and we got to talk about... I'll show you some of the pictures. Talk about uh, Simon the Tanner's house and the port of Joppa, um, where uh, somewhere around there is where Jonah set sail to go out to Tarshish. Maybe uh, didn't pan out that well for him in that regard. But um, 
what's interesting is we'll talk about, we talk about this is Simon the Tanner's house, or this is where such and such a thing took place. One of the things they say is if it's not here, it's near. These are, um, let me go back, I want to show a couple of that. These are um, just statues outside of the theater that we got to see in Caesarea uh, that Herod built. A lot of Herodian stuff. The tourists would say that if it wasn't for Herod, we wouldn't have a job. The um, tour guides would say that. Um, that's a Byzantine era statue. It's a Christian one because it has the lamb around the shoulders of the shepherd, talking about Jesus being the good shepherd. So it's kind of fun to see the different uh, time periods. It's, it's got, I mean, like here in the Bitterroot Valley, if you go to, we just went to the Victor Heritage Museum yesterday, and it's just, here's the history of Victor, and it's, you know, maybe 200 years at the most. But you go to Israel, and it's the history from, essentially, Abraham up to today. And it's, it's the Canaanite period, the Israelite period, you know, the first temple period, and then the second temple period, and then you have the Greek period and the Romans, and then you have the, uh, after, you know, the, well, I guess it's just the Byzantines there, and then Ottomans, and then back to the Christians again in the medieval period. And it flip-flops back and forth, as we'll see some of the pictures. You know, Christian, then Muslim, then Christian, then Muslim. The you know, Christians would take a, a temple to Zeus or something like that and tear it down and build a church there. And then the Muslims would come in a couple hundred years later and tear that down and build a mosque on top of it. And then the, the Crusaders would come in and tear the mosque down and build another church. And they would just go back and forth until the archaeologists have no idea what to do when they're digging this up because it's just a big jumble of all kinds of different stonework and stuff. So anyways, that's Byzantine probably right there. That, they're sitting on toilets. That's Caleb on the left and Gabe on the right. They're cool. Um, those are toilets. Those ancient are ones. Ancient ones. ones. Correct. They're not currently in use. They're just demonstrating. Um, <laughs> I thought that was kind of neat. We're going into, um, pretty soon we'll be walk looking at the, um, what's it called? Hippodrome. Hippodrome, thank you, yeah. Um, that's interesting. As far as the people, that was one of the coolest things for me was the, the people. I spent a lot of time in youth ministry, probably about 15 years being in youth group or helping with youth group. Um, and I'm accustomed to seeing a lot of young adults who come to church and know the lingo and basically know what Christianity is about. But I can tell by their lifestyle that they don't really take it very seriously. Um, and so that's kind of what I was expecting when I met this big group of kids. Um, they're a little bit older than youth group age, but it was really neat getting to know them over the course of two weeks because it was apparent to me that for the most part, they really took their faith seriously. Their love for the Lord was very real to them. And so that was really neat. So that was refreshing for me. Um, anyway, so that's Gabe and Caleb sitting on some toilets for us. <laughs> That's just a really beautiful picture of the water, the Mediterranean. Um, Israel has a little bit of everything. They have the Mediterranean, they have the Sea of Galilee, which is a freshwater lake. They have the Jordan River, which is, from what I could tell, kind of a dinkier river than the Bitterroot even is. And, um, but it's beautiful, and there's great places to hang out around the, the Jordan River. And they have the, the Dead Sea that, that nobody else has. And you'll see some pictures of us floating in that. And then they have the Red Sea, and uh, in terms of the types of, of environments they have, there were some spots that I, I took a picture of that looked just like some of the land around here, with the mountains in the background and the, the farmlands and the sprinklers and everything. And other places are just arid desert, you know, or mountainous and lush, and it's very interesting. So they have a little bit of everything there. They're like the center of the world. Everything kind of collects there, it seems like. That is um, what they call Simon the Tanner's house. The reason I say what they call is because that is probably a house that is built on top of Simon the Tanner's house. But we're pretty certain that that is where Simon the Tanner's house was. And uh, that's the place, if you're not familiar, where Peter had the vision of the net where the sheep being let down from heaven with all the different food, the animals in it that he was supposed to kill and eat. It was shown him three times, and he's like, I can't eat that. You know, it's unclean. And the Lord said, don't call unclean what I have made clean. And, of course, that's essentially marks the beginning of when the Gentiles started coming into the church and being saved and talked to these Gentiles and they were given the Holy Spirit and you know the rest is history. And so that's basically where it happened. And that's where they first told us if it's not here, it's near. So we can't necessarily say it was on top of that building that he was in that trance seeing that vision, but it's very near to that location. So that was really neat. 
that's going to drop off. That is a, a, a statue of Elijah on Mount Carmel. Uh, we got to see Mount Carmel, um, and uh, that was really neat. Uh, we did translate the, the writing around the four sides of it. I don't have that handy, but um, you might pull it up. But we were on Mount Carmel, and whenever we think of the prophets in the Bible, I think uh, in the West we tend to forget that uh, he killed 400 prophets of Baal. That's why he's holding that sword. Okay? And if actually you look closely at the picture, there's a, a priest of Baal under his foot. He's about to put him to death. So, you know, don't serve the wrong God. You know? Anyways, I'll take this and click to the next one. I'll just look for that. There's a few more pictures of... That is the inside of that church of St. Peter, or St. Peter's Church. Um, so I've never really gotten to experience cathedrals and that kind of thing in my life. And um, while being a Protestant, I don't believe in the worship of saints. I don't believe in the worship of Mary. That seems pretty obvious to me in the scripture. But something that the Orthodox churches and Catholic churches do that Protestant evangelical churches in the West don't do that I wish would change is have a means of accommodating a very prayerful lifestyle. And every time I went into one of these types of cathedrals or um, monasteries, I really wanted to pray. And I didn't feel like there was anybody around me obligating me to pray their way because they basically just left us alone. Um, and I really liked that, that I felt like I had a place I could go in and I could pray. And in a lot of cases, they had a lot of great imagery around me to remind me of certain things in the Bible to think about. I want to see that in the, when we get to Gethsemane. Um, so I was really encouraged and inspired by that. And I wish in the Protestant church, the evangelical church, I should say, um, we basically just say, you need to pray, figure it out. Whereas I think we should try to find a way to accommodate a prayerful attitude on a regular basis somehow. I don't know what exactly we could do. I'm not saying we should build amazing, beautiful structures like that, because I don't think that's necessary. I think it's really cool. I think if we're going to spend a whole bunch of money on a building, it might as well be a church. But um, anyways, so I thought that was good. So the, uh, I don't know if I can go back. Yeah, they have to be able to back. Well, so But the, uh, the writing around um, the statue of, Elijah, we uh, sitting in the bus afterwards, we worked really hard Googling, translating back to what it said, so for your edification. Ah, what have I done? <laughs> yeah, I'll get that sorted out if you want to read it. Okay. Read it anyway, so, so there's a different inscription on each side. Uh, one said, Elias the prophet rose like a fire, his word burned like a torch. The next side said, I am jealous for the Lord God of hosts. The next side said, Behold, a small cloud descending from the sea like the clothing of a man. And the last one said, The fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones. Yeah. Um, really good reminder when we go up to uh, Mount Carmel. That is the theater at Caesarea. It's not an amphitheater, because an amphitheater supposedly encircles it completely. That's what I was told. Um, the stones that are around there forming the seat are not original, except for the ones down toward the bottom there that are, are closer to it. Obviously, those seats are not original. Uh, the lighting is original. No, kidding. Um, in any case, there used to be a laser on there. Yeah, there Some seats over those there. Those seats right there are original. Obviously, not the plastic ones on the ground. Yeah, those are <laughs> they're more recent. Um, and it's obviously still being used for concerts and that kind of thing. That, uh, what era do you think that capstone dates to? Any, any guesses? Roman. Roman. It is First. Byzantine because of the cross. Mm -hmm. oh. So I thought that was pretty neat. This uh, is still in Caesarea. This is yeah. still in Caesarea, yeah. Actually, right near there is where they think it's possible Paul was on trial yeah. um, with the governor. Uh, when he said, I make my appeal to Caesar. There's a, a place where they believe it was a, a governmental uh, building where they would have probably had hearings like that. So that's a possibility. Um, and that is uh, Panorama. My panoramas get better as they go. <laughs> but um, So I thought that was really neat. You can see the uh, pillars and everything. This is all Herod's work for the most part. And if I remember right, that there was the area where that, where that took place, right? 
That or that was, maybe up or up in line a little bit, but it's not here, it's near. I think that was the, uh, the ground where they had a bunch of work there. The projection out into the uh, sea there, that was actually where the palace was that oh, okay. the governor or Herod would stay in when they were in Caesarea. Gotcha. That and that's sense. why he was put on trial there. I just took a picture of that so you can kind of see a more a better picture of the layout of that particular palace. The um, mosaic there is original. And there's uh, Palestinians out there just fishing, you know, ordinary day for them just fishing on these 2,000 year old ruins from the Bible. That is a picture of the um, hippodrome. Looking down, it's supposed to be a panorama. That's why it looks funny. Um, it's kind of hard to tell from this picture, but if you zoom in like I can on my phone here, um, this illustrates how things have changed over the course of 2,000 years because during the Roman period, that was a very violent um, stadium. People died, especially around the, cur the turns there. They actually found underneath the, um, the really expensive seating where the governors and elite beats and all that would sit, they found a lot of little idols and icons, including um, menorahs, because the people, oftentimes slaves, that were put in these chariots to, to race, and often race to the death, were from all different cultures, and they would be under that seating area there before they their, their race, and that's where they would pray. And so they would uh, then go out and oftentimes die or get injured in these races. And then over the course of history, when, the, um, when Christianity essentially took over and it became the Byzantine period, the Byzantines built expensive houses out into the Hippodrome. Obviously, when the, the, the Christians took over, they outlawed the, the violent games, um, started building churches instead of temples. And um, so the Hippodrome didn't have any use anymore, so they, it was beachfront real estate, so they built houses out into the middle of the Hippodrome. So I thought that was interesting. That is um, Mount Carmel, a panorama looking out over the Valley of Megiddo, which is really neat. Um, down in there, we got to look at um, Galilee off to the left, and right in front of us is um, the, the Valley of Megiddo, in the middle of which you can see the two airstrips where the, the planes come in and out and they go on their strikes in Syria or Iran now. Um, and it was really interesting because you could stand on that spot where I took that picture and look that way and point, and then look that way and point, and then you could hold essentially the entire nation of Israel in your, in your fingertips. So you can see the edge over there, and you can see the mountains over there where it stops, you know, the Mediterranean to the mountain range. Um, so I thought that was very interesting. But that is, um, I can go to the, I think you can go to the next one. Yep. I was, it was here that I was starting to, to get into the habit of taking pictures of certain verses with the sight in the background. So there you might be able to read it. It says, um, where did it go? At verse 16 there, and they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew was called Armageddon. And that's Armageddon right behind it. You can click to the next picture where it has the, the background in focus. So you can see there, that's where the scripture is talking about. I thought that was really neat. And then the next picture is just a couple of funny looking guys. <laughs> so there we were. So we ate kosher food pretty much the entire time we were there, <laughs> um, which means that in the morning you could have your dairy because you could put your cream and your coffee and that kind of thing, which means basically all the dairy you want to eat in a day happens first thing in the morning. And that's why at a lot of our hotels, there's just cheese everywhere. Um, but then you don't have dairy at all throughout the rest of the day because that's when you have your meats, your beef, and stuff like that, and your lamb and whatnot. Um, so that is how the, the Jews observe kosher meals. And uh, that's what we did. It's pretty common, basically, across the board. You went to a McDonald's down I there. Did. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell them I did. Well, I don't, like. I don't particularly like McDonald's, but there was a group heading over to one, so we're like, okay, we so we went over there just to experience it, and they had their fancy little touch screens for ordering food, and you can't order a milkshake and a burger in the same order. Yeah. So that was interesting. Uh, there's other ones that we walked past that have separate 
ordering stations for dairy and meat products. Wow. Yeah, you can order from the same window. But they use real beef there. <laughs> yeah, it's a big deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. <clears throat> Like well, well, the reason for the kosher, for those of you that aren't aware, is the Torah says don't boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Right. And so in order to prevent that from happening, even in some accidental way, they make sure that all dairy and all animal meat is um, cooked and eaten completely separate, even if stored in the same freezers and everything. And so that's, that's one of the pretty extreme ways that Jews seek to observe the Torah. You know? Even though it doesn't technically say you can't eat them together, there's, they're, they're adding more and more boundary lines to make sure they don't go anywhere near that, you know? Okay. Sure. What kind of cheese was over there? All of the cheese. Yeah. They didn't label it. Well, they labeled it in Hebrew. Well, but not even, sometimes not even that. So you're grabbing what you think is cream cheese to put on your bagel, and it's goat cheese, and stuff the same thing. Dennis? I noticed you didn't show a picture of all the fish you can have for breakfast. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, lots of yeah. fish. Lots of, yeah. lots of everything. Cottage cheese, fish, salads, yeah. and stuff. So the first few days I was trying a bit of everything because I didn't know what it was, it's not labeled. Um, and then after a while it's like, I'll just stick with the cottage cheese and yogurt and stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm too risky. Yeah. But Eventually you find what you like. Yeah. That is Amir Sarfati, if you don't know who he is. Um, he guided our particular tour bus for the second day because our tour guide was uh, sick that day. But um, so it was really fun to see to get to chat with him and we got to do some of the teaching and everything. And uh, so he hung around with us for about half the time. He sometimes had to leave and do different things. He's a really busy guy. That is the Sea of Galilee. It's very beautiful. It was a very gorgeous day when we were there. We'll go ahead and go to the next one. A little selfie I took because we went on a, uh, a little uh, Sea of Galilee cruise. We went on a little boat and mm -hmm. did a worship session and a sermon and all that. And, got to float around. Um, something I did notice that he pointed out while we were there, there was uh, Jews flying by on their jet skis um, <laughs> listening to Michael Jackson <laughs> the Sea of Galilee. And so it's like, I can't escape America even if I try. <laughs> the next picture is of a spring because the waters that come down from the hills around the Sea of Galilee um, come into the spring. I think they're warm, aren't they? Aren't they the hot springs coming down in there? I can't, I can't remember, but in any case, it's a really ideal spot for fish around those springs going into there. And there's a lot of fishermen along that coast, especially back in the day when there were originally apparently seven springs. Um, and that's why the Galilean towns of Capernaum and Chorazin and Bethsaida were in that area. That's why a lot of the, the disciples were fishermen, because that's great fishing territory there. So, go to the next one. This is what they call the Jesus boat. Yeah. It dates to the uh, first century. It dates directly to the time period where Jesus was. And it matches all the, um, it's, it's the remains of a fishing boat, but um, it's like essentially the bottom that got trapped in the mud and preserved. The top portions of it, you can go to the next couple pictures. Um, they can line it up with the imagery we have in mosaics about the Galilean fisher boats, fishing boats. Um, there's, I think, two more pictures of kind of what they think it was, uh, how it was constructed. Um, and so that's about, it's kind of hard to tell in that picture. There's a slideshow going, I was trying to get the pictures. Um, about what it, what they think it would have looked like. And so, um, it's, it's pretty sizable, but um, not a yacht or anything like that. The kind of boat that Jesus would have slept in. The reason they think, well, the reason they call it the Jesus boat is not just because it dates to that time, but because um, there's a lot of things about it that remind people of Jesus, primarily the fact that it's comprised of 12 different types of wood. Right. Um, primarily the cedar from Lebanon, but then it's an expensive procedure shipping the wood down to you know, Galilee and making a boat out of it. So if there's any repairs that need to take place, they would use local woods. And so they actually analyzed it and they found 12 different types of trees that were put into it. So people think, hey, 12, that, that means it's something special. You know, We have no way of knowing if this was Jesus' boat that he stood in it. Easily could have been, but there's no way of knowing it. But that's what they would look like. So that was really neat to see. That was on Galilee. This is the inside of the monastery up at, um, is that, what was that? Oh, that is the uh, hit, uh, Mount of Beatitudes that we were at there. And that was one of the places I got to go in and just, you know, oh, this is a really cool place to just pray. It was quiet. It's raining, like a library, you're not supposed to talk, and that kind of thing. You know, the pity is not 
you have to pay to use the bathroom. All the Jewish sites are free. All the Jewish sites are free. The Christian sites, you have to pay to use the bathroom. <laughs> oh. so, I don't know why. You'd think it'd be the other way around. But anyway, uh, that's the inside of it. The next picture is the outside of it. The domes are really cool from the inside. They're cooler from the inside than the outside, in my opinion. But, um, I think later I'll have a picture of uh, the spot where we think Jesus gave that sermon on the mount. Mm -hmm. Um, again, we, don't, we can't know for sure, but uh, next is a series of pictures from oh, Capernaum. Yeah. This, for me, was the coolest site because um, the ruins of the city of Capernaum are right on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. And um, Jesus, of course, pronounced the woes against Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum because we might remember him saying, if the miracles performed in you were performed in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have remained to this day, uh, which is a whole bunch, a whole slew of theological, you know, commentary that can be made just about that sentence that Jesus said. But all three of those cities are ruins today. Tiberias, on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which was a Gentile city, is still there. We slept in it for three nights. Um, but these Jewish sites that were supposed to recognize their Messiah, where he ministered for several years doing miracles, um, they didn't accept him and, and they're ruins now. This is the 4th century synagogue that is currently built on top or the ruins of it are on top of the first century synagogue. Uh, somewhere in here, it might be in your pictures. I, I specifically put one in of that corner. Of the uh, corner where they had, they had excavated a little bit of the first century synagogue. There it is. Right there. Um, not that one. There, there, right there is uh, the ruins. Doesn't look like much, but those are the stones from the first century synagogue. Is that the mikvah? That was in the, when you come in, it's on the right hand side? Um, that's, well, it that's might have the been one the little area they have cut out of it. Yeah. yeah. They dug in the floor. They were, I think they were saying that somewhere in there is indication of where the door was. But it's um, hard for us to tell because we don't study it. Ruins. But so C Capernaum was really interesting to me because I never realized how many miracles Jesus did in Capernaum. He, in the synagogue, in that synagogue, Jesus healed the man with the withered hand. And um, that town was when the centurion with the faith came to him and said, Just say the word, and my servant will be healed. In that town, Jesus healed Peter's mother. Okay? I think it's in this town where Jesus had a house. I'm pretty sure it's in Jesus' house where they let the man down through the roof and Jesus healed him. That's, that, that event happened in Capernaum. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Capernaum was, I mean, yeah, these towns around Galilee were where most of the disciples came from. So that's the ruins of what well, we're sitting on the front porch, essentially, of the synagogue looking out towards the Sea of Galilee. That big UFO. That's a church that was built on top of a shrine that was built on top of Peter's house. Peter's mother. Yeah. Well, Peter's house, we're pretty sure Peter lived with his mother-in-law or something to that effect. In any case, that shrine, as they were excavating this, they found this strange octagonal shape, and they did some math and figured that it was probably a shrine from the Byzantine period where Christians would immigrate, immigrate to and... Um, to their walking around it and praying, and they found a bunch of writing inside that pertained to Peter, and they put two and two together and deduced that this is probably Peter's house where Jesus healed his mother-in-law. And so another, I think another picture nearby. Um, this is a zoom in kind of thing, yeah. Well, it's hard to tell because there's a just an ordinary Galilean house and then a shrine and then a giant UFO lift on top of it. Um, so don't go on to the next one just yet. That's, that was a fun day we had there. Um, anyways, um, I do have it. Hang on a second. Let me back up and see if I do have that particular verse here. It's not handy, so I'll pull it up. Because I want to read something to you because it was really neat. This is why Capernaum was so fun for me. Uh, maybe it's in Mark. Remember what um, chapter that was in? Jesus coming out of the synagogue. Well, anyways, I'll just tell you. I don't remember the verse exactly, but um, in Mark, there's a verse that says, after leaving the synagogue, they entered Peter's house. The way it's worded is indicative that you don't get out of the synagogue and then travel to go to Peter's house, that you walk out of the synagogue and walk into Peter's house. It's literally like from walking out of this building to walking into that building. That's how far the synagogue was from Peter's house. So I was able to stand there and look at Peter's house and look at the synagogue and see this verse and just realize that this 
you know, this is where that happened. He walked out of that building and then walked into this building. For me, that was really surreal. Made it prime real estate. Yeah, yeah, it was, wow, that's great, that happened here. This right here, this next picture, is when we went on our uh, Razor ride. Because they had a tour group of a bunch of young adults, they tried to tailor a lot of the events to... Uh, Two aliens. To what's that? Two aliens. Two aliens. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Trying to fit in as though we were fitting in. I went, I went full tourist mode on this. I bought a camel back and like the funny hat and everything like that. Uh, I was like, there's no way I'm going to blend in. I'm just going to lean into it. I'm just going to know I'm a tourist and tell by the blank look on my face. No, no, they gave us those because we are in what they call razors, little like four wheeler type cars, and got to drive those around. So that was pretty fun. And that is the next picture is of. Um, a really thorny rose. I took a picture of that and sent it to Shay. There you go. I a flower for you. Um, the thorns there are pretty wild. There's some pretty crazy thorns. So we had to drink a lot of water while we were over there because it was hot all the time. We were walking a lot of the time. I didn't like the taste of the water, but um, we had pounded it. <laughs> lots and lots of water. Uh, that is Magdala. There was a, um, I can't remember if they're Catholic or not, but there were a group of uh, people were building a hotel there, I believe it was, a big fancy hotel, and they uncovered um, the ruins of the city of Magdala, where Mary Magdalene is from. And this is the synagogue of Magdala. That fancy stone in the middle is a replica of the Mag Magdala stone, the real ones on a glass case nearby. All that mosaic is original. Um, you can see the layout of the synagogue with the seating around the outside and everything. Chances are, they think that this was uh, sort of a Christianized synagogue early on in Christianity. A lot of Christians met there, Jewish Christians probably, met there in that town. I thought that was really neat. You can move forward. They found the uh, Magdala stone, which that's a replica of, um, in that synagogue. And it's kind of carved to resemble the temple. And on top of it, you'll see, I think I have a picture of it. Yeah, you can go to the next one. Is the, um, the, the rosary of Magdala. It has 12 petals, essentially, six around the outside and six in the middle. Probably referring to the 12 tribes, but it could also be referring to the 12 disciples, so they're trying to maybe lean into the Christianity there. We don't really know, but that's the original that they found there. Really neat. And so you see that icon referring to Magdala quite a bit on the hotel and around the area, so I think it's pretty neat. This next picture, that road is the main road through Magdala, apparently. And across there, that's not the wall of a building, that's a barricade that the Jews put during the revolt, the Jewish revolt in 70 AD, 68 to 70 AD or so. Because there was a big battle, relatively big battle, that happened on the Sea of Galilee just outside of Magdala, and I think some in the town of Magdala, where 3,000 people died. And um, this was, a, a, to me, it was really sad to see the Jewish, the remains of the Jewish revolt, where they built a barricade to try to keep the Romans out in their revolt. So for me, I, that was just really sad to me, but I thought that was interesting. And that is a kind of difficult picture to interpret, but you can kind of see there's um, several cave entrances. That's a picture of the hillside outside of Magdala. And archaeologists, um, in order to estimate the population of an ancient town or city, they count the number of burial places outside of it. Kind of gives them an idea how many people live there. This next picture is of the um, location of where they think two events happened. The first um, is where Jesus fed the 5,000 on the shores of Galilee. The second is, um, they think, we don't know, they think that stone that the church is built on is the stone that Jesus cooked breakfast on after the resurrection when he met with the disciples. They, they think that because it, it, they know it's near, somewhere around that, is on the shore of Galilee, um, and that particular stone had like char marks on it or something like that. So we don't know exactly, but it is interesting, and it's fun to see that, hey, it could have been right here. You know, it certainly would have been something like this. Um, and so they had a, a pretty cool sermon that Pastor Mike, I'll talk about Pastor Mike in a minute, um, but the church is built on that stone. You can kind of see the stone to the right of the building where the foundation is, and there's more inside. I think I have a picture of the inside. Yeah, you can go to the next picture. That's what they think Jesus offered that breakfast to his disciples that morning. Yep, that builder's her trying it. Boom. <laughs> so, um, 
It's an old church. They're all old churches, pretty much. Uh, but even since like the fourth century, it was essentially a glorified tourist attraction to bring Christians in to see these sites, um, to do the pilgrimage essentially to the Holy Land and see the sites and everything like that. So to some extent, that helps us to kind of know where some of these places might be based on tradition. But to another extent, it's like, well, they didn't necessarily know. They just said, this is it. We decided. <laughs> And so we don't necessarily know if this is legit. But it certainly is interesting to think Jesus might have done that there. If, it wasn't, if it's not here, it's near. So that was really cool. This is, what is it called, Caesarea Philippi? Mm -hmm. In uh, the north, in the Golan Heights. Um, our tour guide, you'll see some pictures of him later. Uh, his name was um, Mikhail. Michael. Mikhail. Um, we always try to say it the right way, but it was Michael. <laughs> Poor Americans. Um, he actually served in the IDF, obviously, as a medic, and uh, he got saved during his service in the IDF because being a medic, he's seen all his friends and comrades get shot and blown up by the Lebanese during the Lebanon War. And he had to really wrestle with that and with life and death, and ultimately that's how he came to salvation, is through dealing with that really difficult stuff. Um, and the reason I thought of that when I was showing you this is because he told us that story as we were driving past, you know, near the Lebanese border, going up to the Golan Heights. Um, so this is Caesarea Philippi, really pretty creek going through it, lots of people there painting pictures and stuff. You can go on to the next one. That is Michael pointing out an altar that they probably sacrificed goats on. So Caesarea Philippi is a location where uh, what they have, what they call the gates of hell or the gate of Hades, as we'll show you this big cutout in the rock. Was, I think that particular cutout was a natural one where water poured forth. And they would go up there, the pagans would go up there and worship and do really bad rituals and parties and things like this. And they would sacrifice goats. And um, Jesus was near there when he talked to his disciples and said, on this rock I'm building my church and the gates of hell will not stand against it. And that's probably why he had them there, went to Caesarea Philippi. Just as he was in the region of Caesarea Philippi when he made that statement. Can you go to the next one. Perhaps that's the so-called gates of hell. It is dry now, for what that's worth. And the next couple pictures, mm -hmm. or the next picture, yes? That's the headwaters of the Jordan River right there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. There you go. Yeah. That's, the, that's where it comes out of that rock. That right there is, um, you can see the arches cut into the stone wall, the big one and the little ones. That's where they would have had their idols. So that was kind of interesting to see. It's all different stuff to different gods and stuff. Um, that is the wall to tell Dan. Well, that's the wall to the city of Dan, which was um, Laish at the first, I think is what it was called. And uh, the next picture shows me standing next to it for reference. Wow. It's a, it's a big wall. That's Canaanite. That was a Canaanite period. That's who built it was the Canaanites. Okay, that's not Roman. That's not Greek, or Hittite, or even Israelite. The Canaanites built that wall. And um, the Danites, you might remember from the book of Judges, Dan was supposed to inherit territory right near Judah, down south, in the middle, essentially. They didn't take it. They chickened out, and they went north and took Laish and called it Dan. And um, some people of Dan settled it, settled there for a long time. And so from Dan to Beersheba, you probably heard that in the Bible. Dan is at the very north. Beersheba is at the very bottom of Judah. Um, modern day Israel actually goes down to a lot. I think Yeshiva is in Judah, isn't it? Samaria was. Anyways. But anyways, Dan to Beersheba essentially is meant to encompass the whole thing, like we say, from Atlantic to Pacific. Um, that's Dan. And um, we get to explore the ruins of the city of Dan. You can go on. That's the outside wall. That's kind of the inside of it. And you can go to the next. That's Michael talk, talking to us about uh, Israelite gatehouses, because um, they didn't really have courthouses. They would meet people in the gate because people have to pass in and out of the gate every day to do their work, usually. And so if you want to meet somebody for some official business, you sit in the gate and wait for them, and you um, arrest them, <laughs> or just grab them and talk to them. You know, like uh, Boaz did this in the gate of uh, Bethlehem when he wanted to talk to the leaders of the, the town and the kinsman redeemer about Ruth. Um, Lot sat in the gate of Sodom judging them. Um, so he's sitting where probably a seat for an elder would have been in that town 
when they're sitting in the gate. So that was kind of cool. Who's Mike? That's Michael. He was our tour guide for our tour bus. We had two buses, the yellow bus and the purple bus. And uh, he was the tour guide for the yellow bus. He was the, the medic who came to faith and he was fighting the Lebanese. That is... Wait, read it. Heavenly Greek Aramaic inscription to the god who is in Dan. Found in secondary use in the staircase leading to the holistic culture structure. The god who is in Dan. Thought about. I thought that was the um, the David thing, but I guess no, not. That's the one. That's later. Interesting. There's a vow to the god who is in Dan. The next one. That's what it is. The next one here. That is what we call, I think they call it the David Stone. So apart from the Bible, which does count as archaeological evidence, because uh, we have dug up Bibles <laughs> but, um, and their historical documents, but apart from the Bible, there isn't really any evidence of the house of David, the man David. The problem is that he lived so long ago, 3,000 years ago, that evidence of that is just it's not going to be easy to find. Uh, but this is... A, uh, an Aramaic inscription on a victory stone, a steel, essentially, mentioning for the first time the house of David by, um, what was the name of the king? Uh, that's not written here. A Syrian king, when he uh, conquered Dan, well, they found the stone in Dan saying something about his victory over the house of Dan, or the house of David. And so, like, hey, there's the house of David. So we know that David did exist. There was a house of David, um, if the Bible wasn't evidence enough for you. I just think that's kind of cool. The next picture is a um, kind of looking back at Tel Dan. The mountain to the right hasn't been excavated, but that part obviously has. But that's really cool. This next site I think is really interesting. That is a uh, model. I love the models of all the different sites they have. I'm big into that kind of thing. Of what's called the Abraham Gate. You can kind of see the little town in the bottom right. What they think the town might have looked like of Dan before the Danites captured it. Um, that is a rendition of what they think probably the gatehouse would have looked like during the time of Abraham. So this would have been a mud gatehouse. You can see a couple more pictures of that. Perhaps. That's the back side of it. Next one. That is called the Abraham Gate. It's covered because it's made of mud bricks from 4,000 years ago, okay? I mean, it's closer in proximity to the, the flood of Noah than it is to us by a wide margin. I mean, it's few, it's less than 1,000 years after the flood of Noah that that was built, and it's still there. Made of mud, they have it covered because the rain will wear it down. Um, they excavated that pretty recently, and that is quite possibly a gate that Abraham saw when Lot was captured by uh, Kedar Omer, when Sodom was mm -hmm. captured, Lot was carried off. Um, Abraham took his men of his household as well as a few of his uh, um, Amorite allies and pursued them as far as Dan and, and rescued Lot. So he might have seen that. They called it the Abraham Day. So that was pretty cool. Uh, later on, we went to, this, to the Jordan River and did baptisms, and at that particular site, there were a few uh, trees that were planted. That was planted by Pastor Chuck Smith. Some of you might be familiar with him. Yes? Vivian and I were baptized in the Jordan here. There you go. At this church site. Oh, cool. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. Mike Huckabee, probably heard of him. Mm -hmm. He's a, and then Governor Mike Huckabee. And then Mr. Uh, Glenn Beck, also. I thought that was kind of neat. Mike Huckabee one of Oh, really? Did you fly one there? Oh, OK. Well, <laughs> that'd be interesting. Lots of places to plant them. But I thought that was cool how they had the little plaques. Like, I know those people. Mm -hmm. So that's the site of where we got baptized. I forget the name of the, that little yeah, facility there. It's a specialized baptismal facility that you can go baptize in. Did the fish nibble at your feet? I didn't stand in the water. I did get baptized. Oh, okay. So I'm saying it's hard to get baptized if you're not yeah. in the water. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, then we went to Beit Shan. Oh, yeah. Beth Shan. Beth Shan. Um, I just wondered, did you see any of the raven fish? I don't know what that is. Catfish. They're like catfish that are oh. on the side of the shark. Oh, gee. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't. Shark. No, I didn't. You didn't see them? That's yeah, not what we were at. Around that area. Yeah, that would have been pretty cool. Yes. 
Um, so this is uh, Scythopolis, which is a Roman city built around Beth Shan. Beth Shan is, that's what I'm calling it, because I don't know what's officially pronounced that, I've heard it a million times, different ways. That hill, way in the back there, is the actual tell of the uh, city that the Philistines controlled during the time of Saul. When they killed Saul, they hung his body on the walls of that city. Um, eventually, the Romans built a city around it, which we got to see. You can kind of scroll through some of these. This, that is the layout of the city. Again, that just blew my mind. I like miniatures, and so I thought that was really cool. Um, and that's just a picture of some of the stonework there and the mosaic. And you can go to the next one. A handsome man standing in front of some pillars. So we got to go tour around the Roman archaeology and everything. Um, and that, does anybody know what that is? Yeah, yeah, a bathhouse. That's how they heated their floors. Um, the floor would have been up above that. They would have a slave in the, in the outside, essentially, shoveling burning coals and stuff onto this floor and allowing the room to get heated up to boil the water and to just make it a steam room. It's a bathhouse. Swastikas. This is before swastikas were bad. They're just a geometric shape that were included in a lot of different places. And uh, especially Herodian stuff. If Herod built it because he was appeasing the Jews. He didn't use images of animals or people or plants because that's against the Torah. And so he would use shapes, triangles, swastikas, stuff like that. Just geometric shapes to make it look pretty. Um, something that was interesting that we learned was that when you're studying archaeology, if the ruins of a city all go one direction, that was probably due to an earthquake or some natural disaster. If they all go random directions, it was probably torn down by people. So all these pillars pretty much all fall in one direction. Scythopolis suffered two different earthquakes over the couple, like over the course of a century, and ultimately it, it just capsized the ability to live there, and so people just kind of abandoned it. That's how I understand it anyway. But these pillars, yeah, go on to the next one, they're gigantic. And they just Go on to the next one. Here's a, I think it's Gabe. Oh, no, that's uh, uh, Xavier. I mean, is it worth it to try to pick that back up? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's gigantic. They so had to erect it at some point. Yeah, they did. But I mean, once it's all laying down, it's just like I'll just move somewhere else. Dennis? When we were there, they, they said under one of those big pillars, uh -huh. they found a body, and his hand was full of money. Oh. <laughs> so you grabbed. He grabbed money and won. <laughs> didn't make it. Didn't make it. That's why they say just leave everything about. <laughs> That's interesting. Right behind you there. They haven't excavated yet. Yeah, I don't know why. There's a lot of spots that they haven't excavated for loads of different reasons. I don't know why well, they haven't excavated. That's yet. a law that they have is you can't excavate without them going in first to make sure you're not going to yeah. ruin something. Yeah. 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 They do. There is the um, Roman. I think it's a Roman temple up on top of there. Um, so yeah, that is the panorama of Scythopolis. That was really, really cool to see. Go ahead and go to the next one. So this is, um, where, where, sure, oh, you mountains of Gilboa, hmm. let there be no dew or rain upon you, nor fields of offerings. Because Saul and Jonathan were slain on Mount Gilboa. Go to the next picture. That's what that's Mount Gilboa, the mountains of Gilboa behind us, as we're driving by. I thought that was really interesting. David wrote a lament for Saul and Jonathan for they died on that mountain. And here we are on Mount of Olives. That's Pastor Mike. Um, he is Amir Sarfati's brother-in-law. They both married a, a pair of sisters, um, and he does a lot of ministry with Amir, and uh, he traveled with us for all our touring and everything like that and did a lot of the sermons and stuff. I really was blessed by him. He was uh, really encouraging. Um, and he said that was a cool dynamic pose of him just looking out over <laughs> yeah. Jerusalem and everything like I'm gonna take that picture. Because we're um, had a few talks there, we got to take pictures. Um, that's Mount Wallace. And we got to talk about Jesus' ascension and his you know the Galileans frequently coming to that mount that hill on their way down to Jerusalem and they go back up to that hill and, and camp out for their the time that they would spend near Jerusalem and everything. And that's the first time we really got to get a good look at the city of Jerusalem. And you can see there's the Dome of the Rock. Um, obviously, it's pretty prominent. You can see the Al-Aqsa Mosque to the left of it. Yeah. Then you can see the uh, retaining wall of the Temple Mount that Herod built. And we'll go look at that. And then 
I don't know if you can see them in this picture, but essentially there's four huge important holy sites. Oh yeah, I can kind of see the blue dome sort of to the, up and to the left of the dome of the rock is the tomb of the, or the church of the Holy Sepulchre, where the traditional view is, or the traditional location is of Christ's death and burial and resurrection. Um, there's no way to forensically be certain about that. We went to, we'll talk about the garden tomb, which is a much more recent find, like from the 70s, which it checks off all the boxes for where Jesus could have been executed, buried, and resurrected. There's other possibilities throughout Israel that could be. Um, we can't definitely know for sure, but anyways. There's also a synagogue up very close to the Temple Mount. And so the three main religions of the world are all just right there. Rick? So did you have a discussion about the building of the new temple and where that potentially will be? I... That came up a little bit. Um, I've heard sermons about that and heard a few different things. Um, my personal view is that it's going to be an invalid temple anyway, so it doesn't matter where they build it. Um, it's going to be, they could either tear down the Al-Aqsa Mosque and build it there. Some people think that it's a little bit to the, I don't know which direction that is, to the side of it because you'd be able to look straight through the eastern gate into the temple essentially. There was some, which I think there's an account of the sun shining through the, temp, the, the eastern gate to the temple. Um, and so there's a few different archaeological reasons why they think it might be here or there or there, but ultimately, so, to me, it's irrelevant because it's not going to be a valid temple. It's going to be essentially an evil temple because it's denying the Lord, and it's going to be the temple that the Antichrist defiles. So when so, Jesus comes back, he's got to... did you have a discussion fixes. with any Jews about that? Temple? I didn't. There was a time or two when I tried to approach a Jew, and they kind of turned off. They're like, oh, you're a Christian tourist, so wall, you know. Yeah. When did the Muslims steal the temple? Um, I forget how, what time period that was. 600, somebody? 600? In the 6th century? century. Yeah. Yeah, but it, it, it didn't become a significant Muslim site until after uh, Israel was back in place. Then it became important because we don't want you to have here, we've got ours. And I mean, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the significance of that is that's where Muhammad's horse ascended to heaven. So, <laughs> so yeah. All right, next picture. We're running out of time here, so um, We are looking down into what a lot of people believe is the Valley of Jehoshaphat, oh, yeah. uh, which is the, well, that's the Kidron Valley, right, between yeah. Mount of Olives and that. So a lot of yeah. people think that's where Jehoshaphat is, the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Um, and so that is a, uh, where am I? Yeah. What book am I in? Chapter 3? Joel? Is that Joel? Anyways, for behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there, on behalf of my people and my heritage Israel, because they have scattered them among the nations and have divided up my land. If you don't, don't think Israel has been divided up by the nations, then just have a look at the last few, just the last hundred years. Um, it's all about dividing up the land of Israel to give it to the nations. And that's the valley they think that Jesus will be doing the judgment of the nations in. Probably he'll bring them through one end and out the other, and he'll sit on Mount of Olives or the, at the Temple Mount and, <coughs> and pronounce judgment. In front, you can go to the next picture. In front of you there, you can see, um, you should go back if you can. Ah, well, it's better. So that's the eastern gate to the city, the old eastern gate. The one from Jesus' time was probably underneath it. Um, and to the left a little bit. Gotcha. Um, and you can see all the, that white in front of it is Muslim tombs. Because to Jews, you're not supposed to walk over a tomb. And so that would defile you. So they're mocking the Jews by saying, your Messiah will be defiled if he comes through this, this gate. But there's a prophecy... Yes, earthquake. Um, uh, what is the, the prophecy? Bring, ra rise up, lift up Hugh Gates. Oh, ancient mm -hmm. gates be lifted up. I've heard people interpret that as saying the earthquake's going to happen, and the actual gate that Jesus walked through originally is going to rise up. And all that's going to be out of the way. And that gate, that, that edifice right there actually has Muslims buried inside of it. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. 
But, you know, in, in the prophecies, it talks about Jesus standing on the Mount of Olives and being split in two, creating a wide valley for the people to escape. Here's the, the other idea that the Muslims have that if Yeshua is completely correct and all of that, he won't define himself, so they would have to raise him up first uh, before he comes in. Interesting. I hadn't heard that. Yeah. Interesting. That's why the Jews want They're to trying to cover their bets. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you might have noticed uh, when I had the Bible, I was taking a picture of the, the valley with my Bible there. And uh, behind my Bible, the, on the Mount of Olives is where the Jews are buried. Yeah. And um, yeah. I might have pictures of it here, I don't know. Um, they put Traditionally, they put stones on top of the tombs. Okay. Yeah, just like this. They just just look all like that. They just go in and put stones on top of their relatives' tombs. Like we put flowers. They put stones because we were told to re recall their time in the wilderness, where they didn't really have dirt to bury with, they bury them under stones, apparently. And so that's the tradition there. There's lots of stones. It's like, how come they don't sweep those off? It looks messy. But no, they do that on purpose. Um, and so, so there's Jews on the Mount of Olives, and then Muslims up against the city wall, and in the middle is where the Christians are buried. All right. Um, uh, just an interesting note. Mm -hmm. The Jews were buried on the Mount of Olives long before Jesus' time yeah. because of the prophecy of him coming from yes. the Mount of Olives. Yep. And so Jesus would have had to have walked through the cemetery to get to Jerusalem. But then how could he do that and go into the temple without being unclean? And for years that puzzled scholars until they found the footworks of a bridge. Uh, there you go. Interesting. Yeah. I forget the name of that. So maybe City Church, Church, yeah. Church of the Teardrop. Church of the Yeah. Um, for the, to commemorate Jesus weeping as he's going into Jerusalem. So that's kind of, we didn't get to go in there because there was a, a group in there doing a thing and we had to get moving. So, but that's kind of neat to see. This is the um, Church of All Nations, uh, the Gethsemane Church. Um, it's really actually much darker in there than you can tell by the picture, much quieter and everything. They built that to kind of get you in the mindset, ideally, of what Jesus was thinking when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane before he went to the cross. So they have it sort of, I don't want to say oppressive, maybe a little bit oppressive, but dark and very, very subdued, yeah. But it was very beautiful. It's these 12 domes, because of the 12 nations that contributed money to it, and the American dome is up in the back right, so it's kind of cool. But it's very beautiful. You can see the original mosaic that they had. Um, next is a stone. Again, they think this might have been the stone Jesus was praying on. No way of knowing. The next one. That is the Garden of Gethsemane. Okay, now, those aren't the original olive trees, okay? May or may, or may not even be the original dirt. It might not even be the original location. But essentially... If it's not here, it's near. And so I took a picture of the uh, passage about Jesus praying in, the, um, in Gethsemane. Um, and in Gethsemane is where they pressed the olives, right? And so um, I didn't bring my notebook, but it was really cool to hear the... Um, I heard Ray Vanderlaan talk about it in the past, and our uh, tour guide, Michael, talked about the three different pressings that the olives go through. And some of you probably know what this is about. Um, the olive tree is a symbol for Israel. And you can tell it's ancient, it's really old, and it's twisted and gnarly and not attractive, but it produces fruit. Okay, That fruit, however, needs to be crushed before it's useful. Because they don't didn't eat olives in their day, like we do. Uh, they crushed it for the oil. And when they take the oil, the olives, they put them in an uh, olive press, and they put a set of stones on it to press the oil out. That first press is the extra virgin olive oil, the super high quality stuff, and that's used for the temple, for the burning, and for um, the perfumes and stuff like that, or is that the next one? I can't remember. I think it's like the, for the perfumes, for like the rich fancy perfumes and oils and things. Then the second pressing, you put more weight on it, is the lesser quality, the mid-tier quality, and that's used for cooking predominantly. And then the third pressing um, is where you get the where all the kind of the dirt and all that kind of stuff. But that's what you primarily use for your oil lamps and everything like that. And Jesus went to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane three times. And each time he was being pressed and pressed and pressed until the sweat came out like drops of blood. I thought that was really compelling when he was talking about that, pointing to the olive trees and the olives on the trees and everything like that. We oh, had wow. a picture when we were there. Our guide took one of the olives and put it on the ground and stepped on it. Mm -hmm. The juice of the olive looks like blood. Wow. Yeah. So that, that's one of the things that was going on while Jesus was praying for us and for, well, 
take this cup from me, you know? So that was as much of a, of a burden he was bearing for us as anything else. They, they know this in 70 AD, all that area was salted. Mm -hmm. So olive trees are at least from 70 on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That again is where they think Jesus may have prayed. They have a carving of Jesus praying there, so that's kind of neat. Now that's the, the facade of the Church of All Nations. It's kind of cool. If you were to zoom in on that picture, you can't, but I can on my phone. Okay. <laughs> on the left, you see uh, uh, it's supposed to represent essentially the rich and the mighty and the wise and learned and everything like that. Um, kneeling sort of in shame and covering their faces while in the middle is the Lord Jesus and, and Father God, Alpha and Omega above him. And to the right is the poor and the weeping and the brokenhearted crying out to God. And so you can kind of see the idea is you have the dichotomy there of the powerful and the rich in this world as opposed to those who, who rely on Jesus. But I thought that was a very beautiful, beautiful cool picture. Story. Yeah, really cool. Next picture. Look at the sun shining down on that. Yeah. That's a great picture. Bullet holes. Yeah. yeah. Well, they're yeah. not Roman bullet holes. They're uh, <laughs> Jewish bullet holes yeah. from when they were retaking the, the city in 67. Yeah. But they're actually, some of it is from earlier when they tried to take it and they failed. Gotcha. That is what the original Eastern gate would look like. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Single one. That's why. Okay. This next picture is kind of interesting. I kind of have to hurry up or time. When I first showed my wife all the pictures I had, it took like two nights, two and a half hours a night. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, that is a, the oldest map of Jerusalem that we've been able to find. That's a replica of it. It's a, sort of a mosaic. It's interesting because there's something noticeably missing in that map. Does anybody know what it is? Well, the dome isn't there because that dates to before the dome. There's no temple. There's no temple, yeah. There's no temple there. The central thing in it is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, because it's all centered around that, because for a very long period, after the, especially after the fall of Jerusalem, in the Christian mind, the Jews were rejected by God, and the church had replaced Israel. Replacement theology was a very common viewpoint, and it still is today. Um, the, that's problematic biblically, because Jesus prophesied himself, as well as loads of prophets in the Old Testament, that Israel would come back, and God's not done with Israel. Okay. And so, for example, just an illustration, Joseph in the Old Testament is a type of Christ. That means Asenath, his wife, is a type of the church, the bride of Christ. She's the Gentile bride. She didn't do anything to become his bride. Okay? She didn't replace his brothers. Now, she comforted him in the absence of his brothers, but eventually his brothers came back to him. Right? And he had his wife and his brothers. Okay? So, anyways. Is that Greek words? Uh, Latin, I believe. I think it's Latin. No, it's, it's Greek. It's, it's, it's Greek to me. I think that was. I think Byzantine. I'm guessing. Anyways, that is the bottom of the wall of Jerusalem from Solomon's period. And if you go to the next one, you can see a little bit more clearly. That is about how high it would have been. So that's pretty cool. Next picture, that is the menorah. Now we were told that this is the menorah they're planning on ideally putting in their temple. I don't buy it. I mean, what's that? Unless they find the real one. Unless they find the real one, or make a better one. Because if you go to the next picture, uh, you can zoom in on that in theory and read what the golden lampstand is supposed to be made out of and how it's supposed to be made. One talent of pure gold, of beaten work. That ain't no talent of pure gold. That'd be a lot of gold. That would not work, okay? And it's not gold at all, otherwise it'd be stolen by now, okay? But to me, it just looks sort of cheap. I don't know. I'm kind of disappointed. I'm like, you guys can do better than that. But that was donated by somebody, and so it might just be more of a token thing they're putting out there for you to look at, so model and everything, so. Anyways, this next thing I thought was very interesting. <laughs> that wasn't McDonald's, that was one of the street vendors. That was, um, that's Forma? It was good, it was incredible. Nice. Listen to Michael Jackson while we ate that too. The next one. You think it looks like an abandoned vehicle on the side of the road? That's not abandoned, that's perfectly functional. Yeah, that is, uh, they would take people down to the Arab quarters. Come back, and the Arabs hate the Jews so much they just throw paint and rocks and stuff and just smash them up. That's why it's got bars and 
grating over the windows and everything like that? We saw that driving around later. Even now they do that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is, I think this is from uh, where they believe David's palace was. Right. And it was probably from about that location that he wrote the psalm talking about how the Lord surrounds his people like the mountains surround Jerusalem. Because from there, from that palace location, the mountains are all around you. So kind of neat. Underneath that, if bench, yep. if you look on the left of that, mm -hmm. that's the mount of offense yep. where Solomon built the temples for his yes. wives. And then all the way around to the right side, you're coming up to the um, Mount of Ill Council. Yes. Where okay. the... Um, per day, UN. UN. Put your advisors on the Hill of Evil Council. <laughs> this is um, some excavations they're doing underneath. And they, the Jews cannot excavate the Temple Mount because it's they don't own it. So they, the best they can do is excavate everything around it. Um, so this is one of the places they excavated where they found some really interesting artifacts. You can go on to the next one. Um, there's a load of people in the Bible whose names are mentioned just briefly. And most of us just blaze over them. But it's interesting because we keep digging up their seals and their signet rings. And uh, so Jehu Call is briefly mentioned in the Bible. Um, yeah, it says it right there. The Zedekiah king said, Jehuqal, the son of Shelemiah, and all these other people to the prophet Jeremiah, saying, pray unto the Lord our God for us. That's Jehuqal, and that's his signet there. Mm -hmm. So, stuff like that just keeps popping up. We keep digging up more and more evidence of these people. That, who built that? Is that the, uh, um, he didn't build it. No, no, it would be the Jebusites. The Jebusites. Built it. The Jebusites but built it was, that. It was proved up on by David and yep. Solomon. Yeah. That's the wall of Jerusalem built by the Jebusites. The next one is the same thing. It just kind of looks like a messy pile of stones. There's, but, there's yeah. actually a name for it. It's not the wall. It's called the... Uh, it'll come to me in a minute. You can go to the next one. They have a model of it. Welcome to our world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was interesting. Um, and what we're going to explore next is how David took the city... Because that's what the city, the wall of the city, more or less would have looked like, or a portion of it, when David said, when David was going to take the city of Jerusalem, he chose the city of Jerusalem, they think, because it was essentially on the border between Benjamin and Judah, and it hadn't officially been conquered by anybody at his time. It was still Jebusite. The Milo. So, what's that? The Milo. Oh, okay. That's, that's what that slope is. Gotcha. That makes sense. Okay. And he probably, being a politician, wanted that city because, well, there's loads of... Uh, geographical and military reasons for it, but um, being on the border and being a so far unclaimed city, he could be, he could basically say it's neutral. He could take this and make it neutral, like Washington, D.C. is neutral, it's not belonging to a specific state, and the same way Jerusalem at the time didn't belong to a specific tribe. And uh, when he went to conquer it with Joab, um, he said whoever gets, first of all, the Jebusites, what they say to him when he was about to take the city? Even the lame or the blind were left, you could not take this city. Yeah, mm -hmm. you won't come in here, but the lame and the blind will warn you off. And David said, all right, my soul hates the lame and the blind. So whoever gets in the city by the water shaft and kills the lame and the blind whom I hate, he'll be the general of my army. So Joab did that. And that is Hezekiah's tunnel. Mm -hmm. As we were about to enter Hezekiah's tunnel, uh, higher up from that is the original Canaanite tunnel, the water shaft that the Canaanites had to the city which Joab and his men, like special forces, would have snuck into to capture the city. Um, so we saw that. I, like, oh, I couldn't do that. It was scary enough being in that one with a flashlight and a bunch of people. Yeah, really. um, especially when they stop in front of you and you're not moving. It got really tense. But, um, <laughs> Should you walk all the way through? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. So that was pretty neat. Uh, I can't imagine doing that with a sword and a shield and knowing you're going to go fight people. But anyways, so this is Hezekiah's tunnel. He built this later. Uh, but you can read about how we created a water system to provide water for the city because he knew the Assyrians were coming. Um, do you have a question? December. What's that? Imagine doing it in December. Oof, no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a question, David? Uh, I was trying to, I was wondering if it was fresh water. Or yeah, yep. So we got to go through that. This, these are stones that have been removed on the steps. I can't remember exactly where the steps were. It's around that same area with, with this guy's tunnel. Does anybody know why those stones may have been removed, in particular by Romans? Oh, is it the gold? No, because there were Jews hiding underneath them. 
And so they broke these stones out. There's a couple of pictures I have of that. When the city fell, a lot of Jews hid under this staircase, and the Romans came in and pulled the stones up and pulled them out and killed them. So that's why they have those gaps. That you it's kind of all over the place. Yeah, the Temple Mount is riddled with them. Yeah. So one more picture of that, and then um, I can show you the next. After we came out of Hezekiah's tunnel, we got sat around this pool. This is only partially excavated. Um, this is the pool of Siloam. Siloam. So when Jesus was in Jerusalem, apparently, I didn't realize this, mm -hmm. he only did two miracles. Did everybody know who he healed? A lame man and a blind man. And a blind man. The ones who David's soul hated. The soul of oh. Jesus did not hate the lame and the blind. He healed them at the two pools, the Siloam and Bethsaida. So I thought that was really neat. Like, oh, wow, that's, that's a blind. I get it. I get it. That's cool. <laughs> so you can impress your friends by telling them that. Um, this is just a, a border of it. So I, I have a picture of the healing of the blind man, uh, or the like, lame or blind, I can't remember. Um, and that's Michael teaching about it. The dirt wall behind it is because it's not been excavated, because it is owned by a different group of people. Who do you think owns that? Muslims. Christians. Really? Yeah, Greek Orthodox people own that territory. They won't sell it to the Jews to excavate. I don't know why. No, there's, just there's a lot of contention as to who owns what. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jesus spoke. The, uh, there was a papal decree that that needed to be returned to uh, Vatican. Mm. They, they actually told them, give it back to us. It's not yours. It's ours. Wow. Well, not really. The deed actually belongs to God. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, that's this, yeah. something I, I was embedded into my brain while I was over there is the status quo there is completely untenable. Yeah. yeah. It will not last. No. Yeah. yeah. You can go on. That is the corner of the um, Temple Mount, the retaining wall. Huge. I, I included that picture for a reason I'll show later. You can go on. Here, if you look up at the top, there's a little bit of a, an outbuilding mm -hmm. coming up. That is the beginning of an arch, of a, of a bridge. Now at the bottom is the crater it made when it was torn down by the Romans during 780. Yep. You see that groove across there that looks like a line on a rock? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that is where the ground level used to be very close, and people would walk along and ch chip memorabilia out of that wall. And there's one, and there's two more above that. Oh, wow. As they excavated, huh. it would bring it down below where they they could walk. So the ground level when we were there in '95 was about level with the bottom of that archway. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's how much they dug out. Open. Yeah, from 93. Yeah. The next that's picture. the original street. Yeah, that, Jesus, that's the original Jesus street. Jesus would walk. Yeah. 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 Um, that is a replica of the, the molding that would have come off the top of the wall um, at the corner. It says something about the person who blows the horn. Yeah. The whole inscription isn't there because it's the blow the trumpet. Yep. Yeah. So that, I thought that was kind of neat. Is that you and Nathan? No, that's their shadows. That's my hat. I don't know who's behind me. Next is when we're going approaching the, um, the side of the Temple Mount. This is the eastern side, I believe. Southern. southern. Oh, so southern. southern. Yeah, steps, that, that makes sense. Yeah, southern steps. Um, so that wall going into that half archway there, that's an Ottoman wall built into the, would have been the exit. So you're not supposed to go in the same way you come you're not supposed to go out the same way you came in. I, Herod's temple, you're supposed to go in one side of the temple mount and leave the other. We were told when we were there that if there's something specific going on in your life, like the death of a loved one, or maybe you have a wedding coming up, you can come out of the this gate, and that is indicative to your friends and family that there's something going on. I don't really know a lot about that, but that's there. So it would have had three gates on the right to enter into and two gates here. The Ottomans just walled it off and built a wall there. So those were the holdup, I think. Oh, okay. Um, so that is me taking a picture of. Um, well, I, go go to the next one. You can kind of you see it. I'm just zooming in on the paragraph where Jesus foretells the destruction of Jerusalem. And I don't, there's probably not audio here, but um, don't worry about getting it up. As we were learning about these steps and looking at this wall and how it's destroyed, basically, it's all ruins. You can see the Muslim mosque over the top of it, and we're talking about Jesus walking on this, these steps. And the Muslim prayers, 
It's one of my children. <laughs> uh, the Muslim prayers are ringing out over this wall. And Jesus was prophesying right there. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, you then know that its desolation has come near. And it says, Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are inside the city depart. And let not those who are out in the country enter it. For these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, for there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And that is exactly what I was looking at when I took that video. There's no temple up there. It's a Muslim, it's a pagan false temple. The pagan prayers ringing out, trampling that holy site. And this next picture is some chump sitting on the uh, same stones that Jesus would have walked on. Those are the original stones. Did you notice that the steps are different widths? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, that was intentional so that yeah. you couldn't approach the temple yep. fast. You had to slow yourself and, and approach yeah. it with reverence. Actually, uh, one of my life uh, Bible chapters is Psalm 127. You should go read it. It's a psalm of ascent. Yeah. And I uh, had the privilege of walking up the steps, and you're supposed to stop on the big steps and read a psalm of ascent as you ascend to the temple. And I got to do that, reading that psalm, going up to the thing. And actually, I might have pictures of it, but we'll get talk about that in a bit there. The next picture is of Caleb standing next to one of these gigantic stones. They're huge. You might you can tell it's a Herod stone if it has that kind of border around the outside. That's a token of Herod's work. The next picture is of um, me ascending the, the steps up to the um, gates to the temple. And I thought it was really uh, touching. I, I always read, I usually read that psalm as it pertains to having children. But it says, if, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. And I'm looking at the destroyed temple, the destroyed house of God. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. The city fell. The Lord did not watch over it anymore. That may be pretty sad. But you can see the archway behind me there. That's not the original from Jesus' time. That's kind of a, a, a remake. The only remaining stones we have are the far left bottom stone. You can click over and I'll show you. Um, that one. And there's an inscription on it uh, from a man who was healed of his disease at some point in the second century or something like that. That's kind of interesting. But that's the original stone right there. And then we went to the Western Wall. And, uh, be careful there. Huh? You gotta be careful there. You want to for birds? <laughs> for birds? Yes. Yeah. He got pooped on. I waited that whole trip to get to the Western Wall. I was gonna have this incredible revelatory experience. I put my head on the wall and started praying and a bird pooped on me. <laughs> no, it wasn't. God's telling me, you don't need to come here to be with me. That's why they wore kippas. I was on my arm. I was kippa. It was down my arm. <laughs> so, they already um, poop on pastors. <laughs> <laughs> it was really warm there when we were there. Uh, and so I was wearing a shirt. It was sleeping. Nothing sexy. <laughs> right. They came over and put a shawl yeah. around. Yeah, they. Yep. <laughs> I was so embarrassed, and when I left, they took it off. Yeah. <laughs> we had to wear kippas. There were three kippas yeah. we could put on and go down there and pray. So I, put a, I wrote a little prayer and put it in the wall, and then I, I, I like to pray with my hat off, and so I came back up and just kind of watched and prayed. And then um, I was look, looking over it. I took some pictures, and I wanted to do my thing where I take a picture of the cool Bible verse with the thing in the background. And this one really, this is where I, I, I broke down and cried because... Um, it's Jesus saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make you peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. They will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. And I, it broke my heart, like, really hard to see those Jews praying, desperately praying, mm -hmm. and they didn't know the time of their visitation, and their temple isn't there. Dennis? I had the same same reaction. I stood there and cried, knowing that they fervently wanted God, 
I mean, it was so far from it. It was such a sad scene. Yep. So that, that was the, the part for me that, was, that really got to me. But that was kind of the courage you could go over. There's a dove sitting in the wall there. I don't know what's wrong. Oh, yeah. I don't know what it means to anything, but I thought that was cool. Yeah. <laughs> That's the guy who's on guard duty. It's his shift. <laughs> The Western Wall is a dangerous place for the Jews also because when the Palestinians, the Arabs, decide that they're having a day against, they pitch rocks. Oh, from that top? From the top of the Western Wall down on the Ukraine Jews. They actually built a gate up at the top to prevent that, but there's no one up there to stop them from climbing over the gate. (laughs) From there, uh, we went to the... Oh, yeah. So this was a hard day. The whole, basically the Holocaust day. This is where we went through the Holocaust Museum and all the different uh, Holocaust Memorial stuff. You didn't get to go through the Rabbi's Tunnel? Not the Rabbi's Tunnel. What's the Rabbi's Tunnel? Sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm certain there's loads of cool stuff that they have another tour that they do for people that have been to Israel and have like the the, the quick stuff. That's kind of what we had, just like cram as much stuff as you can in and then they have another tour for people that want to go and get the deeper stuff. Because you, you pointed out the large stone, mm-hmm. that was small. Yeah. And the rabbi's tunnel was 40 about that. feet long. Gosh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. Uh, Joe Biden was there recently. Um, that is the eternal flame of the Holocaust. The floor is made up of like, I don't know, three quarter inch tiles, square tiles, black. One, there's, there's six million of them. One for each Jew that was killed in the Holocaust. Dennis? So one time we were there was a 30 days after 9-11. Oh, wow. And they had, a, the flame was going, they had the Jewish flag and the American flag there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So this started a very uh, sobering day for us as we walked through uh, loads of different stuff about the Holocaust. Um, there we go. That is, we're going into the um, Holocaust Children's Memorial. At the, that last picture, mm-hmm. that was the names of all of the concentration yeah. camps and the extermination camps. Yeah. Um, now something I noticed about that, I don't, we don't really have a lot of time, okay? In the Torah, there are six cities of refuge that you can flee to if you're a murder, if you're an accidental murderer, essentially. Um, now, there are loads of concentration camps where they, they kept the Jews and they executed them and, and they died there and everything like that, but there were only six, six death nations in Poland during, during the Holocaust. I thought that was like a the dark side of it. Oh, that's scary, interesting. Anyways, this is the beginning of the Children's Memorial. Those are pillars representing different ages, and they're broken off to represent that the children were killed before they reached their full, full potential. You can go ahead and go on. We're going to try to skip through these. This was amazing. Um, this is the Children's Memorial where you go in and they have five candles lit, multiplied by mirrors to be one and a half million times. So there's about one and a half million lights in there to represent the one and a half million Jewish children who were killed in the Holocaust. And the music, can we get the audio? The music in there is yes. really weird, weird. I want you, it's almost 3.30, we're almost out of time, but I want you to hear this. Yeah. And I'll try to blaze through the rest of this stuff. We'll let you run over. If you want, we have to I mean, like, individually afterwards, if I know Yeah, that's fine. Um, What they do is they have over the speakers speaking in uh, three different languages, English and uh, Hebrew and, uh, I don't remember the original. Um, But anyways, the the third one, but the names of all the children they have on record who died of the Holocaust. So they just cycle through these names, their name, their age, and the location they were killed. And it takes them two years to cycle through them. 
before they cycle back. And so I made a point to just sit in there and just, as I was listening to these names, I write, tried to write down one that I caught, and then I tried to think about my kids and their ages. Um, there's no reason it can't happen here. Yeah. Well, we've only had 60 million children. Yeah. Yep. Um, I cannot for the life of me remember the name of this man. Do you remember his name? Um, I'll have to look him up. But he, he I was really inspired by his story. Um, I won't get to do it right now, but it was really cool. Um, I took a picture of this. We went into the actual, there's a, a Holocaust museum that you walk through from one end to the other. I wish we had eight hours to go through it. We had like an hour and a half, and I got through like the first eight. Did that have to do with the Polish <clears throat> Perhaps. Perhaps. But he, he was with these children through the whole thing, and he could have left and saved himself, but he stayed with the children until their deaths. Um, but anyway, so the um, next one is, I just took a picture of that because a couple of years ago, I went ice skating with my wife. And those are Jews ice skating. I saw a little demonstration of what life was like for the Jews before the Holocaust. And I thought that was compelling for me personally. The next picture is um, uh, a goalie. I play goalie. It's a Jewish goalie before the Holocaust. Um, and the Nazi paraphernalia they had in there was, well, it blew my mind. Like, you look at all that stuff. And this is where I got caught. I just This is where I really entered into all the information. I just started looking at all this stuff. It took me like an hour to get through the first little bit, and then I ran out of time to like run through everything else. Um, that was it. You saw a, quick, a brief glimpse of a Nazi war game about ousting the Jews and getting them back to Palestine and all that kind of stuff. This right here broke my heart because this is essentially just explaining how the Christianity of the Middle Ages and moving forward paved the way for the Holocaust because Christians were very anti-Semitic, because they were the Christ killers. You can go on to the next one. And that particular spot that had that all written, that really struck me and, and broke my heart and kind of pissed me off, because it's like, come on, we're better than that. Um, and there's a, a, a St. Augustine quote, slay them not, scatter them abroad. And you can go to the next one. Um, there's just lots of Christian artwork, and then it moves on to, you know, very anti-Semitic stuff, that, you know, salt shakers that look like really bad, evil-looking Jews and stuff like that. So very common in Europe in those days. Um, I thought this quote was really interesting. Um, With the Nazi rise to power, racist anti-Semitism became a political program that enlisted all the resources of the German nation for its implementation. The entire nation was dedicated, all its resources, to the extermination of the Jews. And there's just a few quotes of um, Hitler and other people about their mm -hmm. hatred for the Jews. And the Mein Kampf book is gigantic. The next picture is of some Christians shaking the hand of this monster. Those are instruments for measuring people to see if they're Jews. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next is uh, to see to measure their skin color and hair color to see how close they are to being Aryan. Or not. Okay. What were the implements for? I mean, how do you measure? What is uh, head size, ear size, all kinds of different things, nose size, stuff like that. Eugenics. Eugenics, that's what it's called. Yeah. Very common. <coughs> Natural outgrowth of evolution, evolutionary theory. You can go on to the next one. Let's go. Battery dying. Could be. It says it's on, that doesn't mean it is. Well. Oh, okay. Do it manually. <laughs> um, these are uh, synagogue scrolls that survived when during the pogroms, when the synagogues were being burnt down and destroyed all throughout Poland, primarily in Europe, um, as the, the anti-Semitism was preaching. It's getting closer and closer to the Holocaust. Um, <coughs> you can click through to the next. I took a picture of this in particular because I have kids, and this is a, some kids' toys. He was, in, he was writing letters back and forth with his dad until his dad stopped sending letters because he was killed by the Nazis. His dad had sent him away to be safe and uh, just stopped hearing from his dad. He had sent him those toys. These are uh, the tags that the Jews wore. And this next picture, yeah. that stumped me. 
I mean, well, that could be my wife, Golden Elias. Um, and it's astonishing to me that an entire nation of people follow that. We won't get into it right now, but it's, um, it is, it's a possibility. It's a thing that happens. And we've got to be aware of that. These are some pictures of the predominant uh, death camps and, and concentration camps, the models they had of them. So that, you know, that was uh, Belzec, and then there's Sobibor, and Treblinka, a few others. You can go ahead and click through. At some point, I really started having to rush through. I didn't get to film the entire this entire um, layout here. It's an artwork of Jews being led down. The whole concept is lie to them until the very end. They're going down to just just be registered or whatever to be to take their showers, and they just usher them into their showers and then kill them with gas and then go on. Um, apparently, we're supposed to take pictures in there, so I got requested to not take pictures. Then I had to rush through the whole rest of it. And it was just, like I said, I needed eight hours. I hope to go back at some point and just spend a lot of time in there. Coming out to the very end, though, you get to see a very relieving view of Israel. You see, Hitler didn't get a tomb. Israel got a state. Yeah. So, and for our particular tour guy, he got to go out and see the town that his grandsons live in. He's a Jew. And his descendants, you know, and then one of the, the mindsets of the Jews, especially after the Holocaust, is let's just make a whole bunch of babies because that will get right back at that Hitler guy. You try to exterminate us, we're going to fill the earth, you know, that kind of thing. All right, this is a, a scale replica of uh, the city of Jerusalem prior to its destruction in 70 AD. It, it was, this was awesome. This was so cool. I really like this. Uh, we're looking from the west into it, I think. Um, or maybe that's south. We can go ahead and go to the next one. Um, the wall you see coming down to the left, closest to the screen, that would not have been there at the time of Jesus. That was uh, erected shortly after Jesus. Um, and it would have been destroyed during the, well, that would have been there during the fall of Jerusalem. You can see the Temple Mount there. Mm -hmm. You can go ahead and click over. Oh, yeah. So this is uh, a... Um, in the middle? Yeah, it's the big walls in the middle. You can see the Temple in the middle. Yeah, you'll see this is a... Yeah, you'll see it. When go did they build that thing? I think this is... No, I don't think it's right. This is fairly new. That's a different go ahead and click over. Yeah. This is from the south, I believe. And so... I think I can show you. So, temple? Yeah, temple. Yeah. And I think... Can you see the little... Oh, is that yeah. the southern gate? Yes. Yeah. Wow. And then you can see the western wall, kind of. If you look... I don't have a stick. Point to the corner. The corner of the, that right there, yeah, that's the corner that I took a picture of. And you can kind of see the uh, arch bridge that was collapsed by the Romans. Anyways, we we'll click over to the next one. Um, actually, can you go back to that last one? You can see, um, if you know your the account of Jesus' trial and everything like that, you can see the palace where he was tried under Pilate. You can see the, uh, the tower of, uh, sort of an A, I can't remember what it's called, it's at the corner of the temple complex. It's a fort, essentially. And if you know Josephus, I've, I listened to uh, Josephus' the, the Jewish War of the Fall of Jerusalem, and um, I get to see kind of the things he was talking about. It's really cool. You can see the different ravines and everything like that. You can click over to the next one. This is essentially from the Mount of Olives direction, looking into the city. And so that right there is the uh, eastern gate that we kind of took a, I took a picture of from Mount of Olives. And that is the temple. And um, you can see all around it, uh, to the right somewhere is the Pool of Bethesda. Um, so that's just, you can sit there and just look at it all and point out all the things that happened in Jerusalem and the Bible. And, and On the left is the portico that they said that Jesus taught. Oh, over. okay, so is that Solomon's portico, that big yeah. fancy thing there? Yeah, the and then right on the other side of that were the steps, the southern steps that you yeah. showed. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. What's that? Yeah. Yep. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay, so this is where we're at the shrine of the book. Okay? So this is the top underneath that we'll get to is where they keep the book I'll tell you about. That is represented as the, the, the lid that they found it in, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, and they keep it wet, keep it uh, white. And you can go to the next picture. And yeah, that's the black wall they have opposite it. And that's to kind of talk about to draw your 
mind to the Essenes, who had this doctrine that they were the children of light and the world was the children of darkness. And so that's kind of what that's getting at. But anyways, we went in there. Um, oh, we couldn't take pictures in here. So I'll just tell you about it. Go, go, go back to the other one. Underneath that is the shrine of the book, which is the, the entire complete scroll of Isaiah that they found um, at Qumran, which dates to like two or 300 BC. And so, and unfortunately the one that's in there is a replica because very recently they swapped it out because it was rolled up in on itself in a, a um, well they found it, it was rolled in on itself for hundreds and hundreds of years and then they unrolled it the opposite direction to lay it out and it eventually started to fall apart so they had to save it. But anyways, you can go in there and you can read the entire book of Isaiah from one end around to the other and you can find the spot, Isaiah 53, that tells us about Jesus. And you can find the spot where it transitions from uh, the the first Isaiah to second Isaiah. You might have heard that theory that it was written by two people. Um, no, because it it's one page, continuous thought. Can you even see it right there? It's early really as hundreds of years before Christ. Um, in other words, the Christians didn't add anything to Isaiah. It was already there before Christ showed up. So anyways, that was pretty cool. We didn't get to spend a lot of time there, but they had a lot of cool artifacts and picture uh, scrolls and stuff. So you can go ahead and go on. We went to the um, Israel Museum. Uh, so there's some Kopeshes. Those are single-edged swords. They don't stab very well. Um, anyway, so moving on to the next. That is the David Stone that we were talking about. That's the actual one. What's that? The original. The original, yes. You can go ahead. These are a lot of the uh, artifacts for the different individuals that we were talking about. Um, and Nathan kind of was able to... Yeah. Get a lot of that more better than we, I could. we kind of had to rush through there, so I kind of just like took a quick few snapshots of them. Um, you can keep going, but I'm going to find out who they were okay. addressed to. We can go to the next one. That one is. Uh, I think that's uh, just talking about oh, the okay. different hot trims that had different names gotcha. and stuff written on them. Okay. That one is belonging to Natan, the royal, royal steward. Nathan, he's mentioned. Uh, I think he's under Josiah. Mentioned as a, being a, like a treasurer of Josiah. That is a like a tomb cap kind of thing for King Uzziah. Hmm. It's like, do not open, King Uzziah is buried here, kind of a thing. You can go on. Uh, at the tap, that's what they call that. Oh, that's sideways. I can't read that one. That's a signet, though, and they can see like the image of the signet that it, it embeds. I don't know whose that is, though, from here. Son of the king, though. Okay, so this is pretty cool. This is the earliest biblical writing they've been able to find. It's very, very old, like maybe even before the first temple. I don't know. This is um, this is dated 400 years earlier than the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, the so that's the um, uh, first temple period. The two pieces of metal. Two pieces of metal, very thin, and essentially the ironic blessing. And that's the, kind of a diagram of how they found the words. On it. Okay. Detailed script. More details about it. So that is the, oh, we didn't talk about this, the pilot stone. They found uh, a stone, because for a long time, critics said there's no Pontius Pilate, all this stuff is just kind of made up. No, they found a stone that talks about Pontius Pilate during the reign of Tiberius as governor in that region. All of those four details are on that stone, telling us that this is the guy from the Bible. That stone was in Caesarea. Yeah, yeah, we saw the replica there, I forgot to put a picture of it in there. They found it in Caesarea, but it's at that museum now. It's called a finger on nose stone. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You find a lot of those over there. The red seal that we just passed was inscribed as belonging to Yehoah as the son of the king. Gotcha. Jehoahaz. Ahaziah. Mm -hmm. That is, it's a replica of a heel bone, or ankle bone, with a nail through it. For a long time, they didn't think the Romans used uh, nails to crucify people. You don't have to use nails to crucify people. You just tie them up and see how long they last, but there were nails. That was probably from the Jewish revolt. Probably besides, yeah. Because, you know, in the Torah it says if you falsely accuse somebody and you're trying to get them executed, whatever punishment you're trying to get on them, they put on you if you get caught. And so the Jews falsely executed Christ with crucifixion. During the revolt, the Romans crucified hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, thousands and thousands of Jews. So this is interesting. They found this uh, ossuary, which is a bone box, and carved in the side of it is Jesus, son of Joseph. Okay, so people are like, ah, Jesus didn't rise from the dead. The problem with that is that could have been scribbled on any time after Jesus between 
now and 2,000 years ago. Also, there have been loads of other Jesuses, son of Joseph, because those are very common names. Also, if that was the body of Jesus, how come they didn't bring it out and show us? And then Christianity can go right. on. Right. You can go on. Um, that is Hadrian. That's what he looked like, evidently, or whatever that's worth. We were just running through this museum as fast as possible, and I'm like, trying to take pictures and stuff, because it was supposed to be closed, and uh, they had to make it. There's a scheduling conflict. Uh, Emperor Hadrian, Roman Emperor Hadrian. You can go on. That's uh, it's kind of like, <laughs> that's uh, Brian. Just so you can go ahead and click through these. These are pretty cool pictures of stuff with Roman equipment and that, different things. Alexander the Great, that's what he looks like, evidently. Probably had a nose though. <laughs> nose might have been what that flower actually looked like originally. You can go ahead, go through. That is the Valley of Elah, and I have a picture there of the uh, passage about David fighting Goliath. That's where he took on Goliath. So that's pretty cool. I got some stones from there to give to my boys. I have to have one stage. All right, there you go. Keep going. Uh, that is, I forget the name of that hill, uh, what, what town that was, but that's a town. You go ahead and click on. Uh, We're now passing by, that is the Valley of Sorek, where Dinah is from. Or D Delilah is from, Samson and Delilah. Okay, it's like a valley right between the Philistines and the Israelites. Just drove by real quick. This is um, Emmaus. That's a, a church built, the remains of a church built at Emmaus, where Jesus talked with the uh, disciples there. We can go ahead and go on. That's just the, that passage. This is the Valley of Iowa, Iowa, where the sun stood still at, at, at Gibeon and the moon at Ajalon, and Joshua fought. I got a quick picture of that real quick, so that was cool. That is olive wood at a, a um, souvenir shop. Thought about buying it, but I didn't have like a great thousands of dollars. Of <laughs> yeah. I didn't actually think about buying it. Um, where are we here? Here we're about to go into the garden too. So this is pretty cool. You can go ahead and go in here. Um, here, I forget this guy's name, but he's walking us through the different things. This is a vineyard or a wine press, which means this was a garden. Okay. Uh, so we know that, because we're told that Jesus was buried in a garden, okay? We can go ahead and go to the next one. There's a picture of the, the tomb originally, and you can uh, see kind of where the trough was when they, when they excavated it. Um, that's a diagram of what it would have looked like, probably. That's kind of interesting because one of the things that actually makes me think this has a really good chance of being in the original place is the fact that when you go in, you look to the right to see where the body is. Right. We're specifically told that in the book of Mark. Um, evidently, I don't know for sure, but I don't think that was common. No, it was actually front to back, not usually front to right. back. So that's there's that. Um, and that, can you see the skull? Two it eyes there. Used to be better. Used yeah. to be better. They've kind of filled it up, and now it's a part of the process. Yeah. So I don't know. It might be or may not. They didn't say anything about that. There, yeah, there is a water place, or a, a place where they did quarry off to the left. I don't know if that's, that's there. Wally, Wally doesn't think this is the place. I don't know if it's the place, but <laughs> it certainly is interesting. And it, it's, uh, if it's not here, it's near. So it's very cool. Um, and forensically, it has a lot more going for it than the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Because the Holy Sepulchre is just a church. We don't know what's underneath it. And there's lots of other options, too. But this would really neat. So if this is the place, then that right there is the, the hill on which Christ bore our sins. You know, looking to the right of that, you can go to the next one. Um, oh, I guess not. Oh, here it is. Yeah, this will work. Uh, that's the, it's an Ottoman wall, but it's built right on top of the wall of Jerusalem. And so it's right outside the city gate. There's a road that comes right by there. Chances are he would have been crucified at the base of that hill if this is the spot, because he's supposed to be an example to the people coming into the city. Um, so it fits is that. Is that Muslim graves? Uh, maybe on top of that. No, those were buses right there. What's that? Buses. 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 Yes. Yeah, they made it a parking lot. Yeah. Um, go back a couple, and you can see that's the original picture. It's hard to tell. If you get close, you can kind of see the skull more. Anyways, um, that's the uh, wine press where the, the wine would have flowed. That's a, that's a multi person's place. That, I took a picture of that trough. That's not the original trough, but that's the trough that the stone would have rolled around in. We can go ahead and move. That's the entrance to the tomb. Um, no stone there. No body there, actually. <laughs> you need to go inside it. Yeah. Yeah, those steps are original. And the door, <laughs> the door, the door has been heightened and widened from what it would have been. Yeah. Just to go in. So again, we can't know for sure that this is the place. 
a lot of people that made it pretty hotly. Uh, the people that ran the place were pretty, pretty convinced it was. It's, it's kind of the, the Protestant version of the Holy Sepulchre Church. It's very popular, um, the garden too. Um, in terms of the, some of the details that it checks off, it, uh, it's in a rich man's garden. It's a wealthy location. Um, but you have to be wealthy to have a tomb like that. And so, and it's nearby to the location of where the, the place of the skull. So there's, there's another picture kind of looking down at it. You can go ahead. And that is the, um, just a passage about the report of, of when the women encounter the resurrected Lord there. We did communion there, which is really cool. Um, and so that was, that was the, you can go back, you can just look at that real quick. Did communion there, did some worship, that was really neat. Again, Wally doesn't think it is. I don't know if it is. I, I would like to think it was because I'd love to say that I uh, that that's a location of the resurrection or anything like that. Um, but ultimately, it's not a huge deal whether it is or it isn't because we know that Jesus did rise from the dead and that he was crucified for our sins and he bore our sins. And um, But it was, sure was cool to go see. If that's not the place, then it's at least a lot like it. And if it's not here, it's near. And boy, looking at that tomb where Jesus might have come forth conquering death, um, I have a flower from that garden in my Bible right now. It's pretty cool. Anyway, so you can move on from there. Um, those are Bedouins. They have to keep planting those flowers to speak to them. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> Where's the Bedouins? Those are Bedouins, yeah. Those are tents. Yeah. You can go forward. We uh, got to ride some camels. That was kind of fun. Click the next one. Yeah. Nope. I got to be out of That's not fun. So this next meal we had was amazing. Um, it was at the, uh, what's that? It's at Genesis Land. Um, you can click over to it. They, they filled us up. I, that was probably the best meal I had there. You can click. So that is um, the region where Abraham and Lot separated. And they would have picked, you take this way, I go that way, vice versa. That's so why I have that passage there. Looking, we're looking towards uh, Moab. Technically, there's the Dead Sea. You can kind of see the Dead Sea. <coughs> Anyways, you go ahead and click. That's uh, feeding us quite a bit. So that's just a panorama of that view. It's very, very hot there. Hospitality is a major deal, as you might imagine. I mean, wandering around in that wilderness. You can go ahead. There you go. They give us those little tunics for the sake of immersion, I guess. But you can go ahead. Um, so this is. Uh, where Jesus, this is the, the wilderness where Jesus wandered, okay? Not the spot, but the, the region where Jesus wandered in the wilderness for 40 days. And we briefly drove by Jericho. I tried to get my Bible and camera out really fast to take a picture of it. That's just a building on the side of the road. Behind it is the city of Jericho, but we didn't go there. And then next is, uh, the, these are the caves of uh, Qumran, caves of Qumran, where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. And actually, that's, that's some of the ruins of Qumran. I think Nathan has some more pictures of that. Go ahead. Those are date palms. They were telling us that when it talks about a land flowing with milk and honey, it's date honey that that's being referred to. Because that's more common than bee honey, apparently. So that's kind of neat. I didn't know about that. Um, and this is, oh, this, I took a picture of the Dead Sea and the prophecy in Ezekiel talking about it being restored to life, essentially when the Dead Sea resurrects, if you will. So that's kind of cool. Move to the next one. Um, the Dead sea. That is En Gedi, where David hid from Saul. Yeah. Probably the place where Saul went in and he cut off the corner of his yeah. and broke his tassel. That's En Gedi. Did get to go all the way up to it? We didn't get to go up to it, no. That's where the Romans got their water when they were sieging Masada, though. Which will come into play later. But through, that's the Dead Sea. It's like someone described it as uh, like swimming in whiskey. Or like swimming in a sea of doTERRA oil. Don't get it in your eyes, seriously. Don't get it in, well, it gets in your cuts no matter what. That burns, but it's just like salt caked all over the bottom. It's fascinating. Yeah, don't, don't shave the day you go there. Yeah, don't shave the day you go there. <laughs> oh, I, I put a dab on there. It was like eating fire. Now, uh, we were told if you were to drink like half a cup of it, you'd have to go to the hospital because you could die. Okay. It's like 34%. Uh, set, set it to minerals and stuff like that. So that's about as much water in the Dead Sea proportionally as there is in a human body, which is why you float. So you have as much water in you as a cup of water from the Dead Sea does. So mostly 
Something. Like crazy oil. Yeah. <laughs> that's me walking in it. And that's our view from the, uh, the hotel we were in, looking out over the Dead Sea. And uh, the next one is a picture of, they had us at nice hotels. They really did. They didn't, they didn't, uh, no, they spared no expense. Anyway. So there was a lot of fun little foods and stuff like that they got to try. So that, I thought that was pretty cool. Well, they didn't like the basil they put on. That is Masana. <laughs> and that's the snake path, the serpent's path. We didn't hike that, but we took the tram thing, the trolley all the way up there, fortunately. It was a hot, hot day. You see that. Um, if you don't know about Masada, I encourage you to read Josephus, um, in particular the Jewish War. I haven't read his antiquities yet, but you know it's very interesting. And that is that was Herod's fortress, one of the fortresses he built, kind of for himself, and he has a palace up there. Um, and the Jews pulled up there uh, after the fall of Jerusalem, essentially, and held out against Romans for a little while. And they were very well provisioned with the rainwater and everything, which you'll see. You can go ahead and click through. That's a view from the the. Masada, those squares. Anybody know what those are? Roman, Roman campsites. campsites. Yeah. Purchases. Yep. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When the Romans lay siege to a place, they expect to lay siege to it for 25 years. So if you wake up and see Romans encamped against you, you're toast. Because um, they built they build a, a, a fortress around your fortress. You're not getting out. <laughs> and as we click on, you'll be able to see more of the walls they built around it. That's a model of his of Herod's. Palace on Masada. He was a builder. Yes, he was. He widened that wall, that mountain, a little bit to fit his palace on there. The guy. And there's uh, the main camp of the Romans, where the Roman general probably would have been, and that is looking directly at Herod's palace. So if you're the leader of the Jews, you can look out and practically make eye contact with the guy that wants to kill you. Why is there not a tree? Then you see, and you see, um, it's, oh, this is wilderness, this is hot. The Romans had to haul their water from En Gedi here, and the Jews had water cisterns stored up, and they're bathing in it and everything, and flaunting it in front of the Romans, and the Romans were ticked. But there's a, you can track the Roman wall that they built all the way down to that other camp. It just goes all the way around, you just can't get out. You can go ahead and move on. Um, barely, you can kind of see what the original flooring and wall would have looked like. The triangles there, black and white, alternating and the red and stuff on the walls. This is a uh, reproduction of what they think the um, heating system was like in the walls. They're pretty advanced for well, for Herod stuff anyway. Those are probably the most significant find at uh, Masada. Those are the shards of pottery that the 10 volunteers drew. They wrote the names on it, they put it in, they drew them out. Um, they're the ones that would execute and perform the mass suicide of the Jews at Masada rather than surrender to the Romans. So the Romans built a uh, ramp they, up to the wall. And uh, so these 10 men were the ones. The Romans who, didn't build it. The Jews built it. The, the Romans ramp. enslaved the Jews. Oh, and that's that why the, yes. the people in Masada wouldn't fire down on the people building the ramp because it was our countrymen. Yep. And then once it, it's there, it's there. Yep. Um, and so what they would do is uh, they'd take it in turns. They would draw, and who would kill who? Okay, so we've killed everybody else in here. It's just us 10 left. All right, well, I drew this. I guess you're going to kill me, and then he's going to kill you, and he's going to kill you, and the last person is going to kill himself. And they found those. I was standing on the spot where they found those. Their names were found. There's only two survivors. Yeah. yeah, two women that were hiding somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Now, Josephus says there were like over 900 Jews there. They only found a few dozen bodies there when they excavated it. Okay, either they had been hauled off, or they can't find them, or Josephus inflated the numbers a lot. It doesn't, to me, it seems odd that the Romans would send an entire legion for only a couple dozen guys. But, so, I don't know. I, I tend to lean more towards Josephus, maybe somewhere in the middle. Anyways. Probably through a hole where they decompose. Yeah, that's quite possible, too. That's just looking at the side of Herod's palace there, that he, the portion of the wall he built out to widen the mountain for himself. What nature doesn't give you, he builds. This is pretty cool, this next one. You can see he's pouring water onto this bottle, mm -hmm. and the water flows down into these cisterns. There's like seven or eight cisterns that this water flows down these troughs into it. So every time it rains, you just get more and more water. There are tons of water up there. Yeah. Perfect for a siege. Maybe not a Roman siege, but okay. Next one. That is the, uh, I forgot what it's called, but the place where they store their birds for um, sacrifices and for all the other things you get for bird fertilizer from all their poop, um, stuff like that. So all the little holes in the wall for the birds. 
And that is the uh, where they buried the remainders, remains of the people they found. The whole hill there. There's a tomb there. Uh, what are we looking at here? Oh, Hagar in the wilderness, I believe. That's the wilderness where Hagar and Ishmael were. Got my... This is a replica, a full-scale replica of the tabernacle that we got to go see. Now, they couldn't get every detail right because it would have cost them millions and millions of dollars for all that gold and silver and bronze. But they at least give you the general feel of the, the structure of it, which is really cool. So we get, it was a bummer because all 80 of us were like jammed in there at once. I want to just kind of walk through it myself, but <laughs> can't really do it. That's where the temple or the, um, the altar would have been, a uh, brazen altar. And you can get an idea for the size of it in a second. That's the, the only implement that's not specifically mentioned how big it is, is the, the wash basin. You can click again. The, uh, that's the inside on the left. Well, uh, you, you can kind of get a gist for what the, this would have been the holy place. The priest would go in every day and make sure the incense was burning and swap out the bread and all that kind of stuff. So you can click on, that's um, the menorah. menorah. But again, it's supposed to be a talent of pure gold and uh, gold weighs a lot. And so 75 to 100 pounds, I, in my mind, it would be smaller than that. I thought it was supposed to be on a, a stand, on a table. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. Right, who's talented? It's true. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Bezalel was pretty talented. There's a table of showbread. Uh -huh. Go ahead. Did you yeah. eat any? Sure didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then uh, that's the altar of incense. Uh, that's, I just took a picture of the cool head, all the different, the special holy colors of the, the silver and, not silver, but, Blue, purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine, fine linen, and all that kind of stuff. And that's the uh, outfit that the high priest would have worn. You can read all about this in Exodus and in um, Leviticus and stuff like that. And I encourage you to check out. I learned a lot from uh, Chuck Missler as he went through Exodus, talking about the significance of the different things. In fact, one of the things that the guy here pointed out that I hadn't realized was that the wood that was used for the structure of it was acacia, which we have a picture of an acacia tree, and it's all twisted and gnarly. Yes. In order to get it to work, you have to straighten it out and then you know coat it in gold. And that's just like us. We're the temple of the Lord, and He takes us, us twisted, gnarly, thorny people, and straightens us out, and then puts His righteousness over the top of us, and then we're dwelling for Him. Lecture that. How sure. Straighten it out. Yeah. Tell me. Steam. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Why well, doesn't feel good? But, yep. That, that, that makes perfect sense. And that is a replica. It's not the real thing. Don't worry. Of the ark. And so, uh, scoot the lid open so you can see the Aaron's staff that it budded and the Ten Commandments and the um, man that's in there. So that's where that would have been. So that, that's pretty neat. And that is what the guy told us was an acacia tree. And that's an overhead look down into. I thought that was pretty neat. Looking out over that, there's a sphinx looking thing. The thorns on that thing are monstrous. Okay. I, I think personally that that's the, the thorns that they made Jesus' crown out of, Acacia. But, um, it has some. Ooh. Yeah. yeah, they're famous people. So that's how hot it was. That I like. I like this one because it shows the weather forecast as being dust. The weather forecast is dust. <laughs> I've never seen that here. So. Okay, it was 104 when we were at Masada. Yeah, 93 isn't too bad. 104 was rough. No shade at Masada. So that's Amir and Mike just chatting on our little uh, Red Sea cruise that we were at. It's kind of fun. And I got to take a picture with them. Thanks, Nathan, for taking that picture. They were fun to hang out with. Okay, so this is cool. I don't know if you can hear it, but I am pointing out, um, I think I'm looking over at Jordan there. Over there is Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. thank you. Egypt beyond those mountains. Wow. And Israel. Mm -hmm. And then. Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the nights we had, uh, every night we pretty much had a, like a, a church service. Um, I'm going pretty long here now, sorry guys. If anybody needs to leave, feel free to just up and head out. I don't feel like you have to stay, so I won't feel I won't be offended if you opt to leave. Any <laughs> So um, what the one of the final nights was really uh, powerful. They um, uh, it wasn't. Well, we did have a talent show tonight, which is kind of fun to see people move off and do silly things. But um, this particular night, 
they prayed over everybody and anointed them, and um, had some really, really good worship, and it was really emotional and really intense, and when we were done, well, during that whole time, there were these amateur musicians out doing this music night, trying to entertain the people at this hotel. There's not a lot of people out there, and it was super loud. It's like, gosh, it's so annoying. Every time someone would come in the door, it would just blare. It's like, ah. Anyways, we got done, and then we went out there. I, I, I talked to a couple people, then I went out, and I see this crowd of idiots dancing around, listening to this music. I'm like, what are these knuckleheads doing? And I look closer, and I'm like, oh, that's our group. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess it was a good uh, letting off a lot of that built up emotion and t intention and everything like that. So we had people dancing around and jumping and having a good time. It was pretty fun. This is a, a video that Nathan took of me. I just decided to go down there and join. I don't remember what songs they were singing. Lots of American stuff. <laughs> there you can see the beard. Oh, sure. You probably wouldn't be in there. Yeah. Of course. We could get Nathan down in there. So that was fun. So then uh, the final day we were there, they took us for some reason to the uh, aquarium that was in a, a lot. Um, so that's kind of interesting. That's made of all, all made of plastic that they found in the, on the shores and stuff like that. So don't litter. Um, here's Dory. <laughs> A few pictures of some fishes and stuff like that. And then we're back at the airport. That's um, David Ben Gurion. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a statue of him. That's not actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's not him. Yeah. He's had one in Yeah. He's really got a fat head. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like the, the, the bad guy from one of these things. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, you can go ahead. Um, some sharks. We're back at the time of the aquarium. Octopus. This is an A lot. Okay, so that'll wreck at the beginning. Um, did you want to show your pictures? He only has a few. I already put them in. Oh, they're already in there? Yeah. Okay, well, I guess that's pretty much it. Does everybody have any questions? Yeah, very nice. Very nice, thank you. Well, I mean, that's only like a tiny fraction of all the pictures we took and all of them. I mean, we visited so many cool things. And I mean, there's so much more that we could have visited and seen and talked about and learned. But I mean, they crammed a whole bunch in there lots. David, or uh, Dennis? I noticed you didn't show me a Megiddo. Did you actually go to Megiddo? He did show Megiddo. No, the, the town, the city. Oh, the town Megiddo. Of Megiddo. Because the, the valley. No, we didn't go to Megiddo. The valley is actually the Jezreel Valley. Yeah. But Megiddo is the main town there. We didn't go into Megiddo. Did you guys, did you guys, did you guys, I can see where the blood would go down those hills. Yeah, pretty good. Well, feel free to come up to Nathan or I and ask questions and stuff like that. And we have thousands of pictures. Um, I wish I could spend hours just talking about all the cool lessons we learned as we went through each of these different places and saw places where stuff happens. So that's pretty much it. So, about 35 minutes long, but thanks for your patience. Thank you.